to motivate the next section of calculus, consider a question we haven't answered yet. So, we have power rule for antiderivatives. This states indefinite integral of x to the n with respect to x. It's given by, you take your x, add one to the exponent, then you divide by n plus one, and then add your constant of integration. Now, this rule will work when n is not equal to minus one. Okay, just looking at the formula, if you let n be equal to minus one, we divide by zero, okay, in this term, and we wouldn't want that. The way you should really think of this, what it's saying is, if you take the indefinite integral of one over x, there's not gonna be an answer of the form, okay, scalar times power of x. So it's gonna to have to be something else. Now, to find out what that something else is, we go to the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So that'll say, okay, if you have a function which is continuous on a closed interval, there's always gonna be an antiderivative on that closed interval. Now here, our function is one over x. For the closed interval, we're gonna consider closed interval over any two positive real numbers. Okay, to get your antiderivative, what do you do? You take your function, we'll switch the variable to t, so I'll have one over t. Then we're gonna take the definite integral, as t goes from, in this case, one to x, of one over t with respect to t. So, second fundamental theorem of calculus says, if I take the derivative of this function with respect to x, we just take the integrand, and wherever I have a t, I put an x. So the derivative of this function is one over x. Now, the name we give this, natural logarithm. You might note, okay, you already have a perfectly good function called natural logarithm that has something to do with exponents. So the idea here is those two functions are equal, except here we're gonna motivate everything using calculus. All right, now with this definition, let's see what we can get. So first, how do we interpret natural log of x? Well, if we draw the graph of the function one over t, then natural log of x is just gonna be the area between one and x, okay, below our curve and above the x-axis. So you can think of this as being an area. Now, let's get a rough idea of what our graph looks like. So if I take natural log of one, if I put one into the definite integral here, we have a definite integral going from one to one, that's always gonna be equal to zero. Okay, another way to think of it, if I put x at one, we're just looking at a line segment, there's no area there, so we would say the area is zero. Okay, then, second fundamental theorem of calculus says the derivative of natural log of x is equal to one over x. Okay, that's what I explained before. If I take the derivative of this function, you just take your integrand and replace the t with an x. Now, with that, I can get the second derivative, okay, I have x to the minus one, take its derivative, the minus one comes down, take one off the exponent, gives me a minus two. So I'm gonna have minus one over x squared. Now, we're only defined when x is greater than zero. So, first derivative is always positive, so we're increasing. Second derivative, okay, well, if I square a number, it's always zero or positive. Here it can't be zero. So this is always positive, and then when I put the minus sign in front, it's always negative. So we're always concave down. Take these three items, put them together. We'll have a graph that looks like this. For the end behavior, we have a vertical asymptote at zero. So this will go down to minus infinity. Then this just goes off to infinity as we go off to the right. We have the graph of natural log. How do we get specific values? So if I want natural log of two, I put two in for x, then I have to compute this definite integral. Now, we don't want to use the first fundamental theorem of calculus. That says, find an antiderivative, evaluate your endpoints, take the difference. Here, the antiderivative of one over t is gonna be natural log, 
And that's the function I want to get information about. So that's a step in the wrong direction. Instead, I consider this as an area and I settle for an approximation. So our graph is going to be for the function 1 over t or 1 over x. We're above the interval from 1 to 2. So we chop up our interval and then we approximate with rectangles. Now, I'll go with 10,000 rectangles, all of equal length base. So we're going to have base times height and then add over all rectangles. We put our numbers in. I go to a computer to calculate. And then what comes out is going to be roughly 0.693. So that's going to approximate this area. And we could check this against the calculator. Let's try natural log of a half. So here, we set up our definite integral. If I want to interpret this as an area, I have to have the 1 half and the lower limit. So when I do the switch, I have to introduce a minus sign. Now, for the area, same procedure as before. OK, we take our interval, we chop it up, put our rectangles in. Then we run it through a computer. For the area, we're also going to get roughly 0.693. So for natural log of 1 half, we're going to have minus 0.693. OK, you'll note natural log of 1 half it's going to be equal to minus natural log of 2. So we'll see that with our exponent rule. Let's look at one last special value of natural log. So the graph of natural log satisfies the horizontal line test. So it's 1 to 1. That means there's exactly one x such that natural log of x is equal to 1. Call that x the number e. e is roughly 2.718. It's going to be an irrational number, so it's going to go on forever. There's not going to be a repeating pattern. Now, everything we just said, okay, we have natural log of e is equal to 1. And by definition, natural log of e is equal to this definite integral. So we could check this. I'll use 2.718 in for e. So I'm going to compute natural log of 2.718. So I'll let n be equal to 10,000 rectangles. We'll work out the Riemann sum on the computer. And when you do that, you see that the number that comes out is very close to 1. So this is believable. Now, this is the first time we come across e in calculus. So if you want to run through some concepts from calculus with e, here's a little list to play with. First thing you can do, OK, you can give yourself a workout with the bisection method and your calculator. Okay, you don't need a computer for this. So if I let f of x be equal to natural log of x minus 1, our interval is from 2 to 3. Okay, you do about four or five iterations, you'll start seeing the 2.718 materialize. We could also do Newton's method for the same function. Okay, and again, you don't need a computer. You can just use your calculator. So you have your definition here, which turns into this. And then you could start with the initial value of 2.5. And, okay, and one iteration gets you right to 2.7. And then you can play with that. Now, something else, which we would need a real analysis course for, we also have e equal to this limit here. So we know how to take limits. So one thing you should try is playing around with large values of x. They'll give us good approximations for e. Finally, okay, this is going to be later in calculus. If you get the sequences in series, we can approximate E by taking sums of the form 1 plus 1 plus a half plus 1 sixth, which is really 1 over 3 factorial. And then you just keep adding the next factorial on. That's going to get you closer and closer to E.